following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today our lecture will be on Gnostic psychoanalysis, and this is a topic, the word psychoanalysis, um, it's a very broad topic and classically is related to uh, Sigmund Freud and the theories and the type of therapy that he developed. It's a very intricate, elaborate uh, system of thought. And in this tradition, we are encouraged to always you know, explore other types of doctrines with the understanding that we should take what's useful, but not necessarily um, take everything if there's certain things that aren't in alignment. And in particular, in psychoanalysis, we see in the books and writings and lectures of Sam Allen Vior, he mentions uh, people like Freud and Jung and Adler, who are all related to this psychoanalytic school. And he uses some of the same concepts and same words that are a part of the, um, in a broader sense, the Western uh, psychological um, system of thought or Western psychotherapy. Freud himself, um, what, what I think is interesting he was really the first person in a modern Western context to analyze dreams. So he wrote a book on dream interpretation. And he said, I think, I think the quote is something along the lines of, uh, dreams are the royal road into the unconsciousness. And with that statement, obviously, he's showing a lot of intuition, a lot of um, correct thought there. He also brought... Um, this understanding of the unconscious to the modern world, to the public at large. Obviously, in our Gnostic studies, we know very well that these modern concepts were represented or veiled or symbolized in different ways throughout all of the ancient traditions. However, Freud and many other psychiatrists, psychologists, of that time gave us a more modern representation, a more analytic type of understanding. What's also interesting, um, knowing that he, he really gave a lot of weight towards the unconsciousness, he was at the same time uh, staunchly atheist and materialistic. Um, Freud believed that everything that we are as a person is based on our um, our impressions or our experiences from the moment we were born. So, in order to better understand what psychoanalysis is, and then maybe going further, how to better understand what is important about that doctrine from a Gnostic standpoint, we really should start at a philosophical basis and, and kind of understand where Freud was coming from in order to understand where in his doctrine or where in his system of thought it aligns with the goals and efforts and purpose of our Gnostic teaching. 
Now, simply put, psychoanalysis is a two-parted word there, the first part relating to the soul or psyche. And analysis means to break something into elements, to dissolve something. So through psychoanalysis, Freud was attempting to, in the first sense, he was conceptualizing the mind as something that has parts, something that has pieces, and that this psyche is interacting with itself, different parts of itself interacting with itself, and at the same time, interacting with the world. This may seem a more or less obvious concept to maybe some of us, but at the time that was um, quite revolutionary in a certain sense. Freud wasn't the first person to uh, think about uh, the mind in terms of unconsciousness and, un and things happening below the level of consciousness, but he was the, the person to really make it popular. He, wasn't, he also was not the first person to attempt to give someone therapy by pulling things out of the unconsciousness. Hip, um, some things around hypnosis were, were available then. But he was um, kind of the developer of this quote-unquote talking cure. That if you can talk about, you know, freely about what's going on in your mind, you can reveal what's going on underneath in the, what he would call the pre-consciousness. Um, Freud viewed the mind very much like a... He, he used mechanical uh, symbolisms or allegories to kind of uh, symbolize the mind. So this idea, for example, we, we say many times in modern culture, I needed to blow some steam off. I needed to, to, to uh, if, you, if I don't do something, I'm going to explode, like, because you need to let this steam out. And because if you think of that, that time of, of machinery, of the, of the way kind of a train would work or these type of like mechanical, science was seen as this kind of mechanical thing. We, we still think of it that way, but it wasn't before the nuclear age. It wasn't before a subatomic age. It wasn't in this electronic type of age. Every, like science was really related to this mechanical type of understanding. Even to the point in physics, they thought everything was just strictly mechanical. Um, Newton's laws of motion, for example, revolutionized the world when he was able to see that the world could be understood through a mathematical construct and that we could predict very accurately what the world would do if we put certain forces in motion. Um, so we could, you know, hit, we could take a baseball and hit it with a bat and if we knew all the forces involved we could run an equation and we'd know pretty much exactly where that ball would land every time. So actually what happened, Newton himself was very religious, actually. He was quite mystic. But he brought into this world this mechanical understanding of, of, of how things worked. And there was this understanding that we don't really need to understand the... We don't need to bring in God in order to understand the world. And this is where the beginning of you know materialistic and atheistic type of personality uh, develops from. Other things that... Freud was influenced by was the philosopher Kant, um, just that he began to introduce this idea that there are, there's a difference between what we perceive the world to be and what the world actually is. And there's this huge difference, this huge like almost gap that we can never actually get to the truth possibly because it has to go through our psychological apparatus in the same way that if you put on a pair of sunglasses, it changes the way the world is viewed and, to, and, and it distorts it. But we always have some pair of, we always have some sort of goggles on. Those goggles are how we see space, how we interpret cause, you know, how, how a cause occurs. Like when I knock on the wood, it makes a sound, and they have this understanding that those two things are connected. And we put all of this information into the world. So there's a difference between what's going on in the psyche and what's actually happening. And our experience is the interaction of those two things. Uh, Freud is also very much uh, influenced by Nietzsche and his will to power, uh, in the sense that <clears throat> Nietzsche believed that 
you should drive yourself or you have a drive to do something. So kind of combining all these things together, some of these uh, big things that, that kind of come up with, uh, not just Freud, but a lot of that time is, do we have free will? Because if the world is just a bunch of mechanical interactions, then even our brain could be, I guess, con considered just a bunch of mechanical interactions. Therefore, we wouldn't have any real free will. Um, it would appear that we would, but we. But someone who would take that that point of view would say, well, you just uh, you think that you have free will, but in reality, everything is controlled by elements which are beyond your control. You're just your consciousness is just the, an output. That doesn't do anything, that doesn't go back into the system, doesn't change anything. Um, again, we talked about materialism, and this word here, the tabula rasa, is this idea of a blank slate. That you're born into the world and you're, you're a blank slate. You're, there, you're completely null and void as a, as a person, and you begin experiencing everything, and that starts to bring in all of the input, all of the information that forms who you are as a person. Freud very much believed in the tabula rasa in the sense that he needed to conceive a way that we come up with all of these, what he would call neur neuroses and psychoses, based on just who we are in the short period of time that we've lived. So if you're, th if you're 30 years old and you have a, some type of psychological conflict, then it's based on your childhood. It has to be, because that's where you got everything from. There's no other place where you got anything from. So you can see, if, if you kind of know where I'm going with this, you can see that from a Gnostic standpoint, there's some, some bit of truth there that obviously we have all these experiences, but we do not, from a Gnostic standpoint, come into this world as a blank slate. We come in with a tremendous amount of values of what we would call egos or parts of our psyche that are already related to previous existences. Our soul doesn't come into this world, isn't created by a physical body. <coughs> So knowing kind of where, where Freud is coming from, we can look at his doctrine and, and be able to see what parts are useful for us in a Gnostic standpoint and what parts we can leave behind. For example, Freud's complicated, what, 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 what's called the psychosexual development. Um, it's quite complicated and there's all these um, terms related to sex that seem somewhat contrived and he developed all these complicated theories in order to explain everything about humanity. Um, so he was missing the fact that, well, there, if a person comes into this world with already a lot of experiences from previous existences, then you wouldn't need to have everything developed just in those, those first years. Um, obviously, from a Gnostic standpoint, our goal is self-knowledge. When we say gnosis, that word is, means knowledge, but that, that's an inner knowledge that we're looking for. Psychoanalysis, from a classical standpoint, is looking for that, too, in a certain sense. It's looking to reduce conflict. It's saying that the reason why there's problems is because we have these drives. The drive for sex, the drive for greed or power, the drive to kill others to get what we want. But we have other parts of ourselves that know that's inappropriate, so we have to kind of repress those desires and present in a way that's socially appropriate because if we were just to behave according to these base instinctual desires, we couldn't have a society. So in Freud's conception, we have to repress those in order to have a society for, for a better life. But on the flip side of that coin, Freud kind of, kind of believes that that means that basically society is always going to be full of individuals who are repressing their, their desires because that's the only way to have a society. He wrote a book, um, I think it's called Civilization and it's Discontents. And basically he just, he kind of states that. It's kind of a, it's, it's a real materialistic, I believe a sort of morbid type of understanding of what the world is all about. Now interestingly, or I find it interesting, that Freud himself was raised in a Hasidic culture. He grew up in a Jewish family, but, but like I said, he rejected all religion. Um, he was very much familiar with various Kabbalistic texts growing up. I, I found that very interesting in combination with the way he formulated a lot of these drives. He always related, he related a lot of them to uh, Greek and Roman goddesses. You know, the uh, Eros and Thanatos, the sex drive, the death drive, 
all sorts of other things I won't get into, but they, they always, he always related it to all these mythological characters, which from a Gnostic tradition, we look at those characters as well and we find the truth in there. Um, so he's kind of a directly denying God, but then formulating theories based on these other truths. Um, he really wrote very much against this anthropomorphic type of God that kind of is throwing thunderbolts at a miserable humanity. He really rejected that. And of course, as Gnostics, we reject that version of God as well. But to, for Freud, everything that had to do with religion with everything that had to do with religion was pathological, meaning had to do with an illness. That the only thing religion did was make people sick. Um, it had no purpose. <clears throat> Interestingly, he formulated a a therapy in which a person comes in and basically uh, confesses their sins to an old man with a beard. Um, Jung actually wrote, writes this in one of his criticisms of Freud, is that he rejects the idea of a sinner going to ask for forgiveness to the old man in the sky, but instead has to go to the old man on the couch. Um, Freud, Freud and, and Jung used to be very close, but they separated... Um, Principally because Jung really at heart was a mystic. Uh, he was always having these inner experiences. He had an inner experience related to uh, the First World War. And he was having these really vivid inner experiences that he actually thought he was going insane. And he kind of, he developed what he called, um, I think he called it active fantasy or active imagination. Where he would sit down, close his eyes, and consciously enter into his imagination. And he wrote a tremendous amount in, in journals. He was keeping journals about all of his experiences. And if, if you're familiar with the Gnostic type of meditation, you would know that that's very similar, if not exactly, what we're trying to teach here, which is to consciously go into your uh, imagination. Because your imagination really is a gateway into your unconsciousness. That if you were to open up your attention into the onto the canvas of your, of your subconsciousness or unconsciousness, something's going to go in there that unconscious drives or unconscious symbols are going to emerge. And these are what we call our dreams. But if we're able to go into them with attention and, and hold, hold the, a relationship there, then what you're seeing is a deeper part of yourself. And that deeper part of yourself is your subconsciousness, but it's also related to your innermost. It's also related to your spirit. It's also related to God. Um, and I, I also listed Adler here because um, Samuel and Vior mentions Adler, Jung, and Freud in, in numerous places in his books and lectures. Here, in Fundamental Notions of Endocrinology and Criminology, he writes, Adler, Jung, and Freud have given unto psychiatry the A, Bs, and Cs of scientific criminology. So we can see here, there's, there's something valuable in the Western psychological tradition, but at the same time, the, the goal is, is a bit different. Um, in the beginning, actually, psychoanalysis was seen as this way to completely transform yourself as a human being. Like, they had this really lofty goal. And certainly, if someone undergoes a good analysis and there's a, there's a good um, psychoanalyst working with them, they definitely can develop, you know, kind of work through a lot of things. But it cannot achieve the total transformation of the human being because it's really missing a lot of pieces. So what we're going to do is take a look at what pieces are, are actually important, important and how can we apply that to our Gnostic work. Because our Gnostic work is, is the awakening of our consciousness and the development of all of our capacities. I think the, the first question that I want to ask is, what is the ego or self? And from a Freudian aspect, there's this topology of the id, the ego, and the superego. I mention this because many people sometimes come into, into this tradition, and we start talking about the ego. And a lot of 
concepts, a lot of like baggage is brought over just from a popular understanding of what the ego is. Some of it is kind of what Freud said, some of it's just this, this popular understanding of what the ego is. So I think it's very important to kind of get a better grasp of what we're talking about. The Freudian sense, you know, Freud believes that the, the id is kind of our basic instinctual desires. The ego is more about, uh, we have a sense of ego in ourself. We have somewhat conscious of the ego. But then the superego really is our morals, our, our, our characteristics that are supposed to be appropriate for society. Um, so you can see how the id or the ego have these certain desires, but the superego says, no, you can't do that. You have to be a good person. So there is this conflict, right? These, um, a, a in, intra-psychic um, dynamic process going on. And different ways to kind of for these different parts to all sort of be a healthy individual. But, but really, Freud believes that they're all going to be there no matter what. In the Gnostic sense, we have this term of you know, psychological annihilation or um, psychological death or the death of the ego. We talk in a much more radical sense. We can also relate uh, the ego from a religious standpoint. Um, when in different religions, people are possessed by demons. When there's the evil enemies against divinity, the, inf the infidels, the, the warriors or the army against Arjuna, um, the possession by the legion that Jesus casts out, we can begin to understand all this from a psychological standpoint. Unfortunately, most religion views this just as some type of story, like a newspaper. Like this event happened literally, and by believing in it, you're helping out the greatness of God by, by believing in this story. From a Gnostic standpoint, we understand that the scriptures are giving us instructions of how to better understand ourselves. How to, how to um, integrate our psyche and, and form that connection with our inner spirit. So the possession of the legion and the casting out of, those, of, those, of that legion by Jesus, we could say, is an analogy to be working psychologically, working spiritually to remove elements which are against God that are within ourselves. Um, on an Eastern standpoint, there's a lot of different uh, Sanskrit and Pali words. I have some up here, skandhas, samskaras, or kleshas. Um, and they have different types of translations in English, depending on what book you're reading, who is a translator. But we see the word aggregates, mental formations, uh, or afflictions. Now, so the Western aspect of the Western kind of conception of, of the ego... Um, well, from a Freudian sense, they don't really see the ego as a thing. They see it as just a symbol for what's going on in the brain. Freud himself was a neurologist. But he kind of abandoned neurology because he realized he couldn't figure out what was wrong with people. Obviously, neurology at that point was quite crude. And I think even today, it's still considered crude for what it really needs to be because the brain is so complicated. But he realized he really couldn't get at anything there. So he, he uh, developed this system that kind of was an analogy for what he believed was going on. Now, in the Western kind of religious standpoint, we see that, you know, there's possession by the demons, the devil, Satan. We see it as this demonic, this, this thing, and it's against God, and, we, and, and the people are working against it or trying to strike down the devil or something like that. And again, we have that classical standpoint that it's just this physical entity. But even if you appear from a psychological standpoint, you can have a sense of there's this, there's this part of myself which is trapping who I really am as a person. My ego is trapping my, my true self. Right? So I need to liberate that. Now, from an Easter standpoint, they don't see the ego as so concrete. They see it as with this word here, aggregates. And we've talked about this word before. But the word aggregate means a, a collection or a heap of elements. So um, a pile of stones pile of gravel that you could put in your hand. A um, bunch of tiny things that form into one thing. Um, or mental formations or afflictions. So instead of talking about it as this thing, 
they almost talk about it as a, um, this culmination of the way energy is forced to flow through certain patterns. That energy is being forced to rigidly follow certain patterns within our psyche and that forces to act in a certain way. So from those traditions, you don't see so much of, okay, I have this egotistical element, I have pride, I have this pride and I need to eliminate this pride as a thing. They'll say, I, need, I have this tendency or I have this, this, way, this aggregation of energy, this blockage of energy and I need to change that about myself. So the question down here at the bottom, is the ego real or illusory? Because this is also something that trips people up. You know, because we talk about the ego being a real thing that we have to work on versus somebody who might say, well, I was acting very egotistical, but then I realized it's all an illusion, and I, I just shifted my perspective, and I feel better about myself now. And you might say to that person, well, don't you, don't you have an aspect of yourself that was in that ego and you need to work on that and you need to almost change yourself? They might respond with, no, I, I was, I just, being ego or not ego is just about my perspective at the moment. If I have a bad perspective, then I'm ego. If I'm not, then it's not ego. Um, and it's kind of a um, tempting argument because it means you don't actually have to look at all your past behaviors. Like your past behavior that was bad, that you have made a mistake, okay, that happened because you had the wrong perspective at the time. But as long as, you're, as long as you have a full consciousness and a good perspective now, you don't have to worry about the past. Right? So it's kind of a way to not work on your ego. Um, but in another sense, we say, yeah, the ego is illusory. It's not real. It's not, the real. it's not the real substance. It's not the real truth. So again, this word of, is the ego this concrete thing in our psyche? If our, if our psyche is this type of psychological material and the ego is these like condensations of something that's like uh, almost like a we, we talk about the genie in the bottle right there's this bottle it's the ego and inside of it is our true self we need to break all those bottles so that we can integrate ourselves as a real person or is it just this aggregation of different energy that's pattern that's putting ourselves into certain pattern rigid behaviors the reality is is that it just depends on your perspective it just depends on how you want to work with it. And it's, it's basically that, that question, is the ego real or illusory, is actually what we would call a false, false dichotomy. I ask that question because any individual that wants to do this psychological work needs to continually refine their understanding of what is myself, what is the ego. Because a very simplistic sense of self may be, oh, I have pride. I have pride, Okay. Good, you admit it. You see it, you see that in yourself. But how do you work on pride? Because that's actually a very vague, superficial label. You, it's hard for you just to say, I'm gonna sit down and work on pride. You might be able to get somewhere with that, but it's gonna limit you. Because you're just working with this label. You're only working with what you can see that makes sense in that label of pride. You're actually you're actually limiting yourself. In reality, the better way to work is to acknowledge when you felt something was wrong, you felt guilt, you feel, you, to come into contact with your emotions and to know when, you've, when you felt like you did something wrong and then analyze that for what it is without putting a label on it. Because it may be pride, it may have nothing to do with pride. It may be a lot deeper than that. So what you're actually working with is your psyche interacting with the external world, forming this moment of time that you felt some pain there. You felt suffering. You felt something not good. Whether or not you label that as some type of pride or anger or, or whatever, jealousy, it's kind of irrelevant. What's important is that you understood how the, the exterior world and your interior world interacted to form this moment and how that may have caused you to behave in a certain way that was not conscious that was not what you wanted to be as a person you know that you became egotistical because of the way the world presented itself in front of you that's a more uh, that's a more in-depth way to work 
and we'll talk a little bit more of how this all fits together at the end. I spoke a little bit about this before uh, in terms of the ego and, and different myths. Um, Perseus and Medusa. Perseus has to behead. Medusa has all these different serpents, all these different aspects of ourself, right? Perseus has, can't, can't look directly at Medusa or he'll turn to stone. You know, he can't, if, and Medusa represents this egotistical part of ourselves. So when we, when we try to look directly into ourselves, we fall asleep. We dream. We can't, it's hard. There's this huge resistance to look into ourselves. Uh, we have to use a special type of reflection. You know, the Perseus had to put his, his, his shield and reflect it in a certain way so that he could see what he was doing. And what that's really pointing towards is a, is a skill of inner psychoanalysis. It's a skill of looking into yourself, having that insight. But if you're too direct, you'll, you'll fall asleep into your ego. That's why when we, we, we close our eyes, we fall asleep because our, we, we don't have the attention. We don't have the ability to separate from it. So then we dream and we just wander. Our will, all those drives that we're talking about, just do whatever they want without our consciousness there. Yeah, Theseus and the Minotaur. Theseus has to go through this huge labyrinth to find this beast at the, at the center. Or sometimes it's the catacombs and there's all these dead bodies everywhere. Again, it's a dark place, a dark dungeon with all these different twists and turns. It's really pointing towards the labyrinth of your mind and what's in there. Odysseus comes back from the war and there's 108 suitors of Penelope that he has to shoot an arrow at every single one of them. Again, we can understand this in a psychological standpoint. And again, the Ho Horus and the Red Demons of Seth, in order to see who is going to um, reclaim the throne of Osiris. More ways of understanding religion in a psychological standpoint. Okay, so I've talked about this a little bit. Introspective analysis is really is really what we are attempting to do. And we're talking about introspective analysis as a type of meditation. You know, we know that Samuel Unvior writes that the esoteric um, discipline of, of a Gnostic is meditation. So nothing is more important than learning how to meditate. A person who, who's meditating, even if they don't think they're good, but who's reserving that time to sit down, learn how to relax, and learn how to observe, and learn how to, at whatever level they are at, go into their mind. Doing that on a daily basis is the absolute number one thing to do to transform yourself. But of course, our goal is really to go into ourselves and transform ourselves. It's not just to relax. It's not just to, to, to feel better afterwards. And we do that by really going in and learning how to analyze. Samuel and Veo writes in uh, The Revolution of the Dialectic on the section called Psychoanalysis, we can investigate ourselves, we can introvert ourselves, but when we attempt to, the difficulty of counter-transference emerges. The solution to this difficulty lies in knowing how to transfer our attention inward with the purpose of exploring ourselves in order to know ourselves and to eliminate the negative values that harm us psychologically, socially, economically, politically, and even spiritually. How can the force of countertransference be overcome? This, is only, this can only be possible by means of structural analysis, excuse me, transactional analysis and structural analysis. So, when we say that meditation is the esoteric discipline that we should be undergoing, this is a, this is a big work. This, to learn how to meditate is, ultimately, it's not a simple thing. But you learn by practicing. There's only so much you can read before you have to just sit down and, and learn how to be attentive. When we go into ourselves, when we attempt to introvert ourselves, right, so to point our attention inwardly and see what's there, a counter-transference occurs. Now he's using a word here that's very technical. It's, it's a psychotherapeutic, in the psychotherapeutic jargon. You know, he can't, Freud actually came up with the words transference and counter-transference. 
as what happens between the therapist and the patient when they're in therapy. So psychoanalysis happens between the, the analyst and the, and the patient. We talk about Gnostic psychoanalysis or inner psychoanalysis. It happens between the conscious attention and the ego within meditation itself. So what we're trying to do is understand this valuable concept of transference and counter-transference, but applying it to ourselves inside when we're in meditation. Because there's a reason why it's difficult to pay attention to yourself. We traditionally think of this as fascination. It's an interesting concept to, to think about why do we dream? If you were to ask scientists who are investigating dream states, you know, they put someone down and on a bed and they hook up electrodes and everything. They have all these different, different types of waveforms, different types of stages of sleep and REM sleep and alpha and beta and theta waves going on, all these different things. Um, it's still really difficult to find the exact reason why we have to sleep. It's very quite complicated. And what do these different types of sleep mean? When does sleep exactly start? Is that, I would think it would be an easy question, but it's actually difficult. It's very hazy. What's being confused here is the sleepingness of the physical body versus the sleepingness of the consciousness. Those are two different things. Because your body can be asleep, but your consciousness can be awake. Or your body can be awake, but your consciousness can be asleep. And once you understand that a little bit, then you can kind of better understand what does it mean to really dream? What does it mean to be fascinated? When you walk down the street and you become distracted by something, you see something very beautiful in a shop window, and you start thinking about that thing. You start being able to see what that would look like if that was, if you had that, if you had that, that watch or that, that bag, those pairs of shoes. You see it because your, your mind has become fascinated by it. Your ability to see internally is being used in combination with the desire to own something with a desire to look a certain way, to be, to have a presentation. In order, you know, you can keep going deeper. Why do I have a desire to have that presentation? Because it feels good to, it feels good to dress nicely. It feels good to have that. So is that pride or is that just respecting your body and being, and, you know, and, and not just being a vagabond? Because you go to the other extreme and never shower and just wear rags all day. And I think it was... Uh, I don't remember the names. But there, there was a philosopher who wore, wore just wore a bunch of rags with holes, and I think it was Socrates. He says, we, can see, we can see the vanity through the rags in your, in your vesture. It was Diogenes, I think. Um, so you can have vanity in terms of how terrible your clothing are, is as well. Because you're so proud. You can have vanity in how proud, and you can be so proud of how good, how good you eat. You could be 100% vegan and or all organic and everything. You just be so proud that you're so, such an amazing eater. Uh, but it's all pride. I mean, it's all, it's, I mean, it doesn't mean you shouldn't eat that way. I'm not, that's not the point. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, you shouldn't dress one way or, an, or another. But what is it doing for you? Is it about the health of your body? Or is, it, or, or is your pride also being felt? Are you judging other people because they look differently? Are you judging other people because they eat differently? Then that is about you, right? Again, the, the, the inability to not judge someone when you see them walking down the street. Of course, the first thing we do, everybody, we immediately size them up and judge them. But that's all about us. That's about all the fascinations we have about ourselves. Uh, in the same way that when we're, we're kind of proud about something... We see someone else who presents a different image. Our judgment is protecting ourselves. Because 
obviously that's not the right way to be. I'm the right way to be. That's not the right way to be. I'm going to protect that. I'm going to protect my ego. I'm going to defend my ego. So the way you get to know about this is to look at specific events. You can't just say, well, I know I do. Ha- okay, I have some pride about the way I dress. Okay, that's good to know. Great. But for you to really get into it, you have to see it as a, as a specific event. You have to see, okay, number one, you're, you're observing yourselves. And I guess that's, that's a side of things I haven't really talked about in this lecture. So learn how to pay attention in life. Pay attention to what you're thinking. Pay attention to what you're feeling. Pay attention to what your body's doing. That in itself, of course, is a whole discipline of being aware of yourself, being conscious. This word mindfulness, which is becoming pretty prominent, pretty, pretty um, popular, it's a good thing to become mindful. We should all be, be striving for mindfulness, to be paying attention. Well, what do you do with that, though? You could be mindful and be totally engorged in your ego all day and just be mindful of the fact that you're in your ego, you know? What it really should be is I'm being mindful of what's going on inside. There's this huge ocean inside of me. All these different waters flowing different ways. All these different things going inside of me. When you begin to pay attention to it, if you have a goal, and in our Gnostic studies we have a goal, which is to eliminate all of these unnecessary parts of ourselves so that we have more happiness. Because it's these parts of ourselves that actually cause our problems. So we actually want to eliminate them. We don't just want to become mindful of them. So mindfulness is good. But being mindful of when we're actually behaving in a way that's causing suffering for ourselves, causing suffering for someone else, then we can see it. And then we see, okay, I, I, I definitely was very egotistical in that, in that moment. I was really harshly judging someone. I was really gossiping, really terrible at that point. I just They didn't deserve that. If you're aware of yourself, now you know, oh, that happened, okay. Then you, you bring that moment into meditation. So instead of saying, I'm going to work on my pride today, you say, I'm going to look at what happened in that moment. Whether or not you think you're working on your ego, or you're just not sure what happened at that moment. Was it okay? What, what, did I buy this pair of shoes? Was it a good thing or not? Or am I just, am I just too, too, uh, have too much vanity? You just go into it and observe it. What are the different things going on inside of myself? Where did I get this huge entitlement to think I should always be able to take something first? Or whatever, whatever that moment is. You go into it to investigate it. You don't go into it to see that you already know what it is. Like if you go into it and say it's pride, what are you doing there? You've already labeled it. You're already done. You've already locked it into a little box and filed it away. If you... If you go into it thinking about that it's pride, then you're, you're actually limiting yourself. You want to go into it looking with your eyes wide open, psychological eyes wide open. You want to close your eyes for meditation. But looking, feeling, being present in that memory, being present and marinating in it, marinating in the emotion you had, marinating in the thoughts that you had at that moment, but not becoming identified with it because... We want to transfer our attention into that moment, but the countertransference wants us to become, just become one with that memory and begin dreaming. So this is this, we try to transfer attention inward, but the countertransference is working to just, for our attention to become lost into the ego. So he says that the way to kind of overcome this countertransference is through transactional and structural analysis. And these are two words that aren't quite defined very well in the revolution of the dialectic. Those two words were used in a very popular form of psychology in the uh, 70s and 80s. They're called transactional analysis by a, a, a psychiatrist named Eric Byrne. And he talks about structural analysis in terms of these, these three major ego states. And this is also mentioned in the Revolution of the Dialectic. The three major ego states, so the first one is exteropsychic. 
These are the identifying states that are intimately related to exterior perceptions. These are received through the five senses and are connected with a world of impressions. Neopsychic is, these are the data processing states, in other words, states that properly interpret or misinterpret all the multiple situations that the intellectual animal lives. Our personality works like a bad secretary in these neopsychic states. And then archaeopsychic, these are the regressive states, the memory of the ego that are found in the 49 levels of the subconsciousness. They are the memories of the past that are filed in a photographic and phonographic manner. So it's kind of, these are very, I think, technical type terms, and they might be a little confusing. What it's really pointing towards is that archaeopsychic is related to those really deep desires that, and childish ways of behavior. So we talked in the, in the beginning of the lecture about the tabula rasa and how that's not really the case, that we actually bring with us a lot of egos from past lives. And those are developing, those are being integrated into our personality as we're growing up. But the way that they're integrated is related to our much larger idea of our evolution of our soul that the way that those egos are kind of being integrated into our new personality are going to um, reflect the way that they are in our psyche. So certain egos become more manifested the older we get. So related to our childhood, there'll be older, older egos. You know, a child is born into the world and they instantly have a certain tendency to be, behave in certain ways. Anyone who's, who's had children or been around children, one is like this, the other one is like this, completely, completely different before there's been any kind of parental influence. It's just always been like that. We could say from a scientific standpoint, they would say, well, the genes are different. But from a Gnostic perspective, the genes are the values related to your, your past egos. Like there's a reason why you have those genes. So a chaos psychic is related to infantile or childlike states but also the basic, most, most instinctual desires as well. Neopsychic is related to, <coughs> neo meaning new. So neopsychic is really the best of the three ego states. Ne neopsychic is related to what's going on right now, hopefully properly interpreting what's going on. So this is the most uh, uh, kind of rational type of state. We might call this, sometimes we talk about bad egos and good egos, and the good ego just kind of does everything right, but it's still asleep, it's still not awake. Um, that's related to the neopsychic state. Exteropsychic is related to exterior perce perceptions and how we believe the world should be. And sometimes it's called the parental state. Like, I think the world should be like this. I'm going to parentify you. I'm going I'm to be the parent. I'm going to tell you all what you need to be like. In, in classical structural analysis that um, Dr. Byrne developed, he, he related exteropsychic to this parent state. So he related archaeopsychic to child, neopsychic to just a rational adult, and exteropsychic to this parent state. So what that means is that when you go into structural analysis, if you are looking to work on an event of life, and you're trying to meditate on it, and you're trying to go into it, but you are unable to. You're, f you're feeling the counter-transference. What's written is, to overcome that, use structural and transactional analysis. So structural analysis would be understanding what state is this ego in? What state am I in? What, what is this? Is, was, it a, was, was I acting like a child? Am I, is that a childlike thing? Is this me trying to be a parent and tell people what to do. Um, I'll give an example, a simple example. Let's say you're, you're at home, you're living with someone, whether it's your roommate or your spouse or a significant other or whatever, and you find yourself very aggravated that you're always the one to take the trash out. You're always doing this one uh, type of chore over and over again, right? And you're, you're because you're finally being aware of yourself, you're realizing you have a lot of resentment about this. And maybe there's been 
arguments about how chores should be divvied up. You sit down and you meditate. You may first think, I'm completely righteous. I am taking out the trash every single time. And I've told the other person multiple times, and they say yes, and I've never done it. All these, all these things, all these things are running around. That's all that countertransference, because you're still feeling the pain. Whether you're right or whether you're wrong, or whatever it is, you're not happy right now. You weren't happy at that moment. You're holding that resentment. <clears throat> I know it's, it's kind of a simple problem that we're dealing with here, but this simple problem is just as important as any other big life problem, because this is how we begin to know ourselves. You're not going to start at this humongous problem of what's the meaning of my life, you know, or you know, what was I put on this earth for or something. By dealing with these really basic problems that throw us off kilter, that unbalance us, this, that's what's important. That's what's here and now, to work on that. So if you're feeling that resentment, don't discount it. Don't say, it's, that's not spiritual. I don't need to work on that. I need to work on my relationship with God or I need to work on becoming more spiritual or something. This is becoming more spiritual. When you work on your resentment, that is it. So don't discount that. So you're, you're sitting in meditation. You're sitting in meditation because, number one, you notice you have a resentment. You may have been holding that resentment for weeks and you were completely unconscious to it. So finally you have a moment of mindfulness and you, you, you notice it. So you say, okay, I need to work on this then. But I, you go into analyze it and you may, may begin to feel that I'm looking at this objectively. I'm definitely the only one. I'm taking out the trash every week. It's always me. And they're just being lazy. So from this perspective, if you were to go into structural analysis, as it's kind of explained here, uh, you would probably see that you're, you're trying to be the, the parent. Like, I need this to be, I need the world to be in the, I need the, the world to be like this. Like, this is what I was taught when I was growing up, that you do your chores. So you're really trying to, really, you have this relationship that's not a parent-child relationship. It's two, it's two adults. But you want to tell the other person what to do, or they're not agreeing to it. It's not, you don't have the relationship, is not set up the way you want it to be. So really, when you start to think about it in that perspective, okay, they, it may be true that I'm always the one doing it, but really what's causing me to suffer is that the world isn't the way I want it to be. And at that point, you have that choice of relaxing and either accepting the world as it is or not. That doesn't mean you completely understand that event. It doesn't mean you completely comprehended that event, but it might help you overcome that countertransference. Because what's written there is not that structural and transactional analysis will completely comprehend your ego. It says this is a way to help overcome some of this countertransference is by looking at what's going on and seeing what state your ego is in. And really, this, type of sh this is really quite simple. If you were to think about, well, okay, was I acting like a child or very instinctually? Was I acting like parentifying myself onto other people? Or am I, or am I just misinterpreting data? Again, that's not going to be enough to completely uh, comprehend your ego, but it's a way to at least set yourself up. What's the structure? Now, from a more general standpoint, forgetting about this, if you talk about what's, what's the structure of my ego, and, uh, we talk about in this tradition our personality, our ego, and our essence. And we, have, uh, we have this whole tree of life that kind of organizes our emotions, our thoughts, our instincts, that's another way to structure. What's the structure of that moment? M simply put, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What was I doing? That's another way just to look at what, what is, can I, break, can I break this down? Can I analyze this moment into pieces so I can at least get a grasp at all this tension and emotion that I'm having that's making it difficult for me to go inward and have peace about this? So when you talk, when you see it from that perspective, uh, you know, your personality is about just the way things have always been. Like you, you've born up in your personality. Your personality forms just by what, what your home life was like, what your nationality is, what your culture is, how you speak, how you dress, just based on 
you just learned all this stuff from the outside world, and it's just, this is just the way you are. It's just your personality. That really is a very superficial sense of ourselves. And our ego, in terms of our three brains, what am I thinking, what am I feeling, What's, what are my instincts? Again, you can ask yourself these questions as almost like talking to yourself. You can do that just to start, to break it up. doesn't mean that's the end point. In fact, if, if you just left it as an intellectual dialogue, you wouldn't get far enough. We often talk about meditation and we need to, you know, silence the mind or have the mind go into silence and go deeper. But if you're having such a terrible time that a few kind of structural questions will help you, then do it. That will help you. So the other half was a transactional analysis. And this is sort of some of the things I was talking about before, when you're walking by and you saw the nice item in the store and you th instantly think about buying it or what it would look like if you had that, you can analyze the transactions. So the basic transaction is what's going on in the outside world? What's going on in the inside world? The basic transaction is, I saw that something, the impression came in, and something about myself was attracted towards it. Very simple transaction right there. But when you really think about transaction, when, when a transaction happens economically or in business, each person gets something out of it. So what do I get out of you know, fantasizing or imagining what it would be like to own that, that nice, beautiful thing? What do I get out of it? Because there's a reason why my ego was on one moment about something else, this impression came of, of, this, of this thing in the store, and I immediately shifted all my attention and all my inner vision, all my imagination just went right into it without me even doing it consciously. So what did I get out of it? Why am I attracted to that? There's something about that that I get out of that, that, that my ego was attracted to it. So that's what I mean by transactional analysis is that it's serving some purpose. So if I'm attracted to that, it's related to things, to owning things, and maybe you would, maybe you would go deeper and, it would be, and you would see that, well, if I, I enjoy owning that. I enjoy that. That's something that gives me a sensation. That sensation is so addictive to me or so fascinating or so pleasurable to me because of something else that's about me. Because there's lots of other people who maybe aren't so influenced by this, whatever this object was, you know. Some people are really into technology. They need the latest iPhone. Some people love shoes. Some people love, have a collection of books. They just have racks and racks of books, and they just always like, they, they love their collection of books. Um, what's it, what's, what's about me? Is this transaction going on? Um, you might say, well, it really comes down to a sensation, right? Because you have the exterior world. The exterior world doesn't actually go into you. The exterior world brings about something out of you that gives you an experience. And it's those experiences that are actually we're fascinated with. Of course, the most intense types of, ex of those experiences are related to sex. And those are the ones that can most quickly pull out of ourselves that type of craving. Right? So all of the advertising, all of the movies and popular culture that's using sex as a way to pull those drives out of us and to animate very, very powerful, instinctual aspects of ourselves. You can see that most clearly with that. But really, it's with anything. It could be any conversation you're having, there's a dynamic process going on. You may not be aware of it at the moment, but uh, going to transactional analysis means that it's that basic understanding, as I said in the beginning of the lecture, that we have these different parts of ourselves, and they're interacting. They're interacting with ourselves. They're interacting within ourselves. So I threw up this word intrapsychic between one structure of my mind and another structure of my mind. That this sensation is so tempting to me to give myself this sensation because it's feeding something else about myself that I don't feel good about who I am. I don't feel good about, 
I need to get good compliments because those compliments really help me get through the day. Right? I feel good when lots of people compliment me about that. Okay, so if you don't get the compliments, you feel bad. Why do you have this sense? Why are you carrying around this sadness with you? Why are you, in a certain sense, you're getting something out of it, right? You have a, if you're, you're carrying around the sadness, but you're overcoming it in a certain way to get good compliments. But that's, of course, a very superficial way of living life. There's something much deeper that can be corrected and fixed, and that's what we're looking for. So, of course, then there's the interpsychic between my mind and another mind. Analyzing how we relate to people is very, very beneficial because our relationships, whether it's in our family, our loved ones, friends, strangers, at business, they will tell us so much about ourselves if we are able to remain conscious and, and be attentive of how certain people bring out certain elements in ourselves. We want to be with some people. We really don't want to be with other people that bring out different things. Learning how to take those moments into meditation. Seeing where, where was I at before I had the interaction. That's kind of the structural analysis. And then what was going on between us? We had this interaction, right? And then the interaction came into me. Then all these interactions within myself actually happened as well. It, it gets difficult to provide more and more concrete examples because what's going on in our mind is so complicated. The, the basic un premise is that there is something going on, that there is a dynamic going on here. So... I basically spoke about this already with, in the classical sense, transference was when a client transfers values onto a therapist. So if a therapist is sitting in the room and the client starts acting like, like the therapist is their mom or their dad or something like that, because obviously it's this person, they're kind of telling about their life and the therapist maybe is giving them helpful advice. So there's usually often a powerful transference going on. Freud, Freud saw this and said, actually, what's going on here, we can, we can leverage this because something about their unconsciousness is happening that's presenting itself to me. So the therapist, a good therapist, is able to analyze how and why that transference is occurring because the, the patient doesn't realize they're, they're doing that. They don't realize they're, they're acting like that. And again, so if you're with anybody in the real world and you start, you, you really just don't like someone the first time you meet them, it maybe has nothing to do with them, it has to do with your transference onto them, that they remind me of someone else. And countertransference is the opposite. It's when the therapist is unable to do their job because they have all this emotions coming out unconsciously and they're putting it onto the patient. So in classical psychoanalysis, it's countertransference that really limits the ability of the therapist to do their job. So in inner psychoanalysis, if we use the analogy, if I can get to it, introspective transference and countertransference. Countertransference is when the therapist, or we could say the consciousness, becomes identified with the subject of analysis, which is our self. You're going into meditation, and instead of actually uh, being able to keep your attention inward, because of the fascination, pulls us into it, and instead of meditating, we just fall asleep. All right, so, okay, so part of what I was, I've been talking about is how do we, what is the Gnostic method? If we were to call it Gnostic psychoanalysis, and I've been sort of hinting at that the whole time, which is we are the subject of analysis, but we're also the uh, analyzer. And when we're sitting down for meditation, we have both aspects in ourselves at the same time. <clears throat> so we are both the object and the subject observing it. But we need to be very careful. It's a very delicate balance between, on the one hand, sitting in meditation and falling asleep because we, don't, we couldn't keep any 
attention separate from our ego, right? Then there is the opposite where a person sits down and they don't have any connection. They almost divide themselves. Because we talk about the the subject and the object and we need to kind of observe the ego. So there's this observer, the object, observing the subject. But it's really that's all of us right there in the same mind. So really it's a division of attention. It's learning how to place attention without becoming lost in it. And you may be able to conceptualize that as subject and object, but sometimes there's a danger of splitting ourselves into two halves, the bad eye and the good eye, the bad self and the good self. And when you, when you do that, you're evading yourself. You're evading um, what really ne- you need to work on. Sometimes it's this idea of the material, animal, I, self, and this divine self that we have. That the divine self is what we, we need to become. And that's a very, that's a kind of a dangerous concept because what divinity is or what that numinous presence is or that divine is nothing to do with our experience of self. It has nothing to do with our experience of ego. It has transcends all of that. So when we, if we come too comfortable in thinking of the object and the subject, we may start to believe that we have this transcendent version of self. We become pride, uh, full of pride. So if we talk about a methodology, we have three parts to it. Discovery, judgment, and execution. So we talked about discovery because you notice You become mindful and you start to notice when you're behaving in a way that's not good. How do you know you're not behaving in a good way? Well, number one, you have have the morals and values that you're raised with, that culture has. Sometimes that's a way to understand that. Like, I shouldn't have have lied, I shouldn't steal, I shouldn't... All these very very basic things. Um, But really it comes down to looking into yourself and and becoming in contact with your emotion with your kind of inner judgment, like, that was a bad thing that I did. Even if everybody outside of you thinks it was a good thing. Well, that was a good thing I did. Even everybody outside of you thinks it's a bad thing. That takes, that takes time and skill to develop your inner judgment. But <clears throat> when you begin to observe yourself, you begin to see the bigger consequences of how you behave. And you begin to see how your activities, your behaviors cause suffering, not just for yourself, but for the other people in life. And the people that, you, that we cause to suffer the most are the people that we love the most. So we discover something. As soon as we discover it, now we can work with it. Judgment or comprehension. That's the sitting down. That's, the, that's analyzing it. And there's different levels of that. Like I said, the structural and, tr- and transactional analysis is one level. You can, you can develop a, quite a bit staying at that level, but it's really not enough. You need to learn how to, if necessary, use that, but abandon it at some point as well. Because at some point you need to develop that attention to go more deeper into that void of, of yourself, that, that uh, subconsciousness. And, that re- and it begins to reveal itself to you because you have attention of it. You're able to place your attention inward more and more. When we're uh, meditating, sometimes people who are struggling, they'll say, well, I'm just not, I'm not good at meditating. That's, a- anybody who hasn't meditated before, that's, that's true. <laughs> but anybody who's learning how to meditate went through that process. It's not that some people are born, um, and all of a sudden they learn how to meditate. Everybody has to go through that process. And when you're learning how to meditate in a discipline, is you're noticing when you're attempting to become, attempting to be attentive or to be conscious, to be mindful. And there are elements within yourself, these mental formations, these samskaras, these kleshas, these aggregates that we talked about, that pull your attention away and you start thinking about stuff. You have to place your attention back inwardly again. 
and then something's going to pull you away, and you place your attention back inwardly again. Every time you're doing this, you're gathering a little more attention. It doesn't happen one time. You know, when you're training a donkey, when you're training a dog or something, you have to repeat the motion again and again. And it's not a coincidence that in the East, they talk about the crazy monkey mind, or they relate the mind to the stubborn mule or elephant. And they have to, you have to, you have to pull with this gentle, consistent force to get that animal to do what it needs to do. And that's the symbol of Jesus riding into Palm Sunday on a, with a horse and a colt, that he was able to tame that aspect. And we do that through the, a gentle, consistent discipline. Because if, if, if you use a force, then it's, you're actually causing disruption in your mind. You're using too much disruption because you're, you know, if you're trying to yell at your mind to be quiet or to force your mind to be quiet, what you're really doing is, is actually separating yourself and just locking yourself in the superficial quietness. So use a gentle discipline to bring your attention back, to bring your attention back, to bring your attention back. Every time you do that, you're accumulating that attention. But then there's also an, a, an ability to shift because when, you've, when you have cultivated a certain level of uh, mental equipoise, when you've cultivated a certain level of attention, you, you, it's, it's like focusing that flashlight so it's more intense, right? And you're able to see deeper into the darkness. When you become a, a little bit more competent in meditation, you notice when you have more mental equipoise. And now you can make a shift and you can, you can place something as your object of meditation. So one thing is just open, expansive awareness and bringing your attention back, bringing your attention back, and practicing pratyahara. But when you go deeper, it's because you have accumulated that attention, you can either uh, intentionally bring something into your, mind, into your meditation practice, that event, for example, that you want to meditate on, or it could be, it could be anything. It could be the next thought that, that, that comes, that because that thought really surprised you, and now you can go into that thought with uh, a force, an energy that you simply didn't have before because you cultivated that. When you do this, you, you develop that skill, whether or not you're good at it or you're a beginner or whatever, you work at the level that you're at. Because even if you practice and you, all you do is bring your attention back a hundred times, that's a good practice. What's not a good practice would be if you fall asleep five minutes and then 40 minutes later, you wake up. That's not really good practice. But if you, for 40 minutes, bring your attention back, bring your attention back, bring your attention back, bring your attention, that's a good practice. That's a very good practice. Um, but you, you cultivate mental equipoise in order to go into your ego. Again, this is a difference between some other schools that they have a very good practice of, of um, Vipassana or mental equipoise but they don't necessarily teach really how to go into the ego. They don't teach a practical way to look at your practical daily life problems and go into it. They might, they might even say, well, we're looking to develop the comprehension of the ultimate reality of mind, the ultimate reality of space. And of course, you'll, begin, you'll get that development. But they're missing this practical daily life thing because a lot of these traditions or related to an age when if you wanted to learn how to meditate, you, you shaved your head, you put on robes, and you lived in a monastery or a cave. That was, that was it. That was the way that you went into these traditions. And this world is, is different than living in a monastery. And if we want to develop best and as, as quickly as possible, not in a... Uh, not with pride, but quickly because we're suffering then we need to work on practical things. We can also meditate on the absolute. And that's, that's also, a, you know, we do that as well. But we need to work on a very practical things. And many times when you work on these very practical problems, because you, you develop that and you go into it and suddenly you, you see something, you have a flash, you have an insight that takes you to the ultimate reality of that, of that moment. 
And so in that moment, you see the ultimate reality. So you, you get a comprehension or you find judgment at the level that you've reached. Because the, the, the comprehension can go deeper and deeper. But if you've reached a certain level of comprehension, we have this third aspect we call ex- execution or elimination. And this is where we diverge very radically from any Western psychological psychotherapeutic concept because in any type of psychotherapy the goal is not to eliminate the ego the goal is just to have less conflict in life to just you know kind of organize your ego so that you don't have so many problems that's certainly beneficial but it's not the same goal that we have as we are looking to, to comprehend those aspects of our psyche which were formed through improper actions, improper behaviors, those, that's what we call the ego, the aggregates, those form through improper behavior. And it's only through comprehension that we can eliminate them. But the elimination or execution of them can't happen with just, the, with just our self in this mind. It requires... Well, we put up here the Divine Mother Kundalini. Whatever that Divine Mother is, whatever that aspect is, who is related to our sexual energy. You can see here on the psychological mythology slide, uh, Perseus has the head of Medusa here, but there's a woman... With a long spear as well is Athena. So Athena is the Divine Mother in this mythology. And it was only because the Divine Mother gave the weapons to Perseus, gave the shield to Perseus, gave the armor to Perseus, that he was able to do that job. So you will find the Divine Mother, the Divine Goddess, in many different, just about any real authentic tradition or religion. And it's the Divine Mother that gives birth it's the Divine Mother that causes death as well. They're connect- she, she's connected there in that aspect. So it's by appealing to our Divine Mother that we can have the energy to connect with, with her to be able to really actually find true fundamental change. And by sexual super dynamics, that's just another way of talking about sexual transmutation, which we have many different practices related to that. We have pranayama, different mantras that work with our sex drive, our libido. Again, this is another aspect of Freud. Freud, Freud said that everything's basically based on sex. And in a certain way, he's right. But the way that he specifically formulates it all is not necessarily what we agree with. But the, uh, sex is the fundamental drive of the, of the human being. The difference is that Freud only saw sex as an animalistic behavior, because Freud only saw us as material animals. From a mystical standpoint, sex is the root of our spirituality. That it's through sexuality, through the transformation of the energy, that we develop spiritual connection. That the sexual energy and the spiritual energy, they're the same thing. So we teach ways to work with that. Because the sexual energy is a drive that anybody can relate to. It's, it's, devel- it's always there. There's a sexual drive. And it can overcome any emotion that you have, any thoughts that you have of who you want to be or what you want to do, the sex, sex comes and it, it just arrives into our psyche and fascinates us and drives us to do things we may not otherwise have done. It's also the most powerful type of energy we have. Um, and it's also the really the root of creativity. You know, the creator, if you, want to, if you want to view it in that sense, from a Western sense, the creator created the whole world with what? With the creative energy. We mimic that creative potential through sex. 
And it is through sex that we can say that sex is the power of the soul. In other words, to, to synthesize this. So, meditation is our, is our discipline, but we have to also learn how to leverage that sexual drive because we can't ignore that. In a modern sense, we have a lot of, we have, um, a lot of popular so-called spiritual movements and ways of thinking about the world that are more spiritual, but a very clear line exists between wanting to be spiritual and wanting to appease our sexual appetite. There's a very clear line that, yes, we become spiritual, but don't touch anything about my sexual desires. That's foolhardy. It's not going to work because the root, the power, the driving force of who we are as a person is there. And it's a very, um, it's seductive to believe that you don't have to do anything with that part of your life. But that's, the, that's, that's where everything comes from. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,